So welcome everyone to the Integral Conference and you are here in the room where we talk about conscious aging and ongoing journey. And we have with us Anne Roberts, Bettina Wichertz, Jane Duncan Rogers, and we should have also Monia, but she has expressed an act of self-care, which meant that she decided not to join us because she felt that it would mean too much stress for her. I'm Heidi Hörnlein from the Wisdom Factory, which you could see on my background. And I am the creator of the Conscious Aging series together with my husband uh, on the Wisdom Factory. And that was a project which started uh, some time ago. I will about, talk about that later. I myself am um, German. I'm living in Italy in this house, which you might see on the background. And I came here because I wanted to study opera before I had done linguistics, mathematics and stuff in the, in the university, but I didn't really like it. I wanted to be with nature. And then when I started to get the books from Ken Wilber, that was so exciting and I had nobody to talk with that. And so for more than 20 years, I go to all these conferences available in Europe first of all in Germany and since then also in Hungary. And I'm very inspired to bring integral content to people in a normal language. And I invite everybody who wants to be on a show with me like today. Today we give you an impression how a Wisdom Factory topic is dealt on video with a specific uh, topic today is conscious aging, but we talk about many other things. So now I would give over to, who wants to start? I think Anne, I see Anne here waiting. <laughs> you must uh, unmute you. yourself. Uh. Good morning. Uh, my name is Anne Roberts. I live in a small village just south of Scotland. And I am retired, or as some people say, refired now. And I host a program called Act of Wisdom, an inquiry into our elderhood. Um, I had a career in management consultancy, and I retired in two 2015 from uh, the Scottish Police College, where I taught uh, leadership to senior police officers, would you believe? And I had two aspects that I brought to the party. One was a body of teachings, earth wisdom teachings, that I started studying in two, uh, 1996. And about early 2000s, I came across Integral. And it was like I'd come home. In both those territories, I felt I had come home. And I wove this mystical basket of teachings I had with the much more practical cognitive uh, aspect of uh, integral theory um, into uh, a body of coaching practice and group work that I really enjoyed. Um, and now I host a program for uh, my generation called Act of Wisdom and Inquiry into our Elderhood. And I'll speak more about that later, but I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Shall I go next? Okay. Hello, everyone. Really good to be here. I'm Jane Duncan Rogers of BeforeIGoSolutions.com. We help people to make good end of life plans, but I wasn't always doing this. In fact, I hadn't thought about aging or definitely not death um, until 2010 when my husband was diagnosed with cancer and we had a year together um, before he actually died. And it's the result of that year that has led me to running this social enterprise, not-for-profit organization now. After Philip died, I went through quite a lot of um, challenges, as you can imagine, as most people do when somebody close to them has, has died. And the result of it was that I wrote about it. I had already been writing as a coach and a, and a therapist for many years. And I wrote a book called uh, Gifted by Grief, and this was my memoir, full, I thought, of spiritual awakenings, and it was. And that's what I thought readers would be interested in. But in fact, they were interested in the chapter where I wrote about the questions that I asked my husband before he died. Things like, 
what kind of coffin do you want? Um, how do you want your body dressed? What are your passwords? And even as practical as what should I do with the car? Uh, you know, I knew that he loved his car and I didn't know what, when it should be sold or how to look after it properly because he'd always done that. So very, very specific, very practical questions and readers really like this. And so that began the beginning of, that began um, before I go, what became Before I Go Solutions where Jane, I, I, I yeah. think we are still in the presentation mode, uh, oh, who we are, and we don't go yet into the, into, I mean, presentation, That's introduction, fine. I have to say. It's okay, you know. I'll say uh, more later. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think so. You will have a lot to say about that. And let's get over to Bettina, yeah. Yeah, good morning. Um, I am Bettina, um, living in Göttingen, in the middle of Germany. I am... Um, I'm a professional gerontologist. I work with the topic aging. Um, I was first a pedagogist um, and um, was a teacher at nursing schools when I, um, when dementia found me and I um, found out that I have a, a good intuition for understanding people with dementia. And so I uh, made my master degree in gerontology later and um, I wrote my master thesis about an integral concept of dementia and I will talk about that a little bit later. So thank you for introducing, excuse me Jane, but it seemed to me that you were already doing your presentation so okay. this space was only dedicated for a short uh, introduction about who we are and where we come from. And to the audience, uh, I welcome you all. There are quite a few people so early in the morning in such a topic, you know. Uh, I'm, really, I'm really inspired that you are here. Uh, I wanted to say these are some of the people who were with us, uh, with us and with me on one of these interviews in the Wisdom Factory. And as I said, I want to give you an impression as it is when you be my guest. And there's also in the audience some people with whom I have already talked and I love to do that. So we have conscious aging. What does it mean to you? What do you think that it is? How can you relate to that? That would be the question for the breakout room. Uh, Carmen, could you put people three or four in yes. one room? Coming up. And then uh, you have about 10 minutes and then we come back and after that we, uh, every one of us will give you a short presentation and then there are times and moments where you can ask questions and we can go into a group discussion. Okay. First the breakout rooms. Okay, so we have now some time to share. Who wants to share uh, their insights or their orientation towards con conscious aging or what came up in the session? Please unmute yourself and get your space to come in. Well, my name is Elmer. Hi. Hello, Elmer. I want to start. And, um, and it, was, it came up, it was very clear for me that my body and my spirit, well, that's a unit, but my body shows symptoms, you know, pain, but also overcoming pain. That's very interesting. I overcome fibromyalgia uh, to, uh, to a very good degree but still there's a reduction of sexuality there's a there's a, 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 all other stuff you know uh, <laughs> the fluid in my body uh, I can't close so much as uh, dropping stuff out you know okay these are the limitations but my spirit gets stronger the older I get the older I get, the spirit gets stronger. And also the resilience um, towards uh, what <clears throat> 12 steppers say, uh, uh, bullshit, you know, in life, which basically means um, a terrible stuff, of what is, um, what can influence you and draw you down I'm 
resilient towards this stuff, you know, I, I can say, stop it, stop it. And also helping others to stop, it, especially women, where they, where they uh, are lacking this, this healthy, manly uh, energy of just cut it, you know, cut stuff what is so terrible. And now dealing with a woman, she gets, she gets um, persecuted by her adopted daughter for the money. And well, this is an aspect and uh, came up. And this, this, the second thing I want to say is that I also prepare for the life in the other dimension, which I 100% know from certain sources near-death experience um, and um, what is this um, um, hypo, hypo hypo um, is a hypnosis hypnosis yeah people telling of this dimension and I accept that and I'm looking forward to this dimension Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alma. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else wants to share their insights. David, yes, I'm like David. Oh, uh, I'll go ahead a little bit. I was surprised not by what we said, but by what we were willing to sit quietly and not say. Uh, I think. Everyone there was uh, a person of experience and uh, strong will, uh, who not only has had the capacity, but the life experience of uh, doing and sharing and creating. But it, we were able to sit quietly with each other and um, uh, withdraw from being a forceful presence. Were you only men in the group or how was it? No. Okay. So if I understand it right, you, you did a meditation together? No, it was more like a quiet presence um, and accepting, uh, perhaps after a 20 second pause, politely waiting for somebody else to say something, uh, we would come in briefly, but um, uh, a willing willingness to not share. Mm -hmm. And what? How, how did you feel? What was it for you? Did you feel awkward or was it fine for you? Both. Both. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Somebody else, uh, Carmen? Mm, and Hans. Know. Yeah. Wonderful. Hans, come on. Hans, we met in the very first uh, conference in Hungary. And he recorded the session I will later talk about for, for me and Mark. Okay, Hans, over to you. Oh, hello, Heidi. Great to see you again. Um, yes, in our group, uh, we were talking um, about um, also this uh, connection of uh, the fear of death or the avoidance of facing death and mortality as being connected to how aging is approached um, in society. And um, like I was talking about my own fears of dying that I had ever since I was a child. And so I was kind of always aware of the aging process also in a sense of moving closer to death and usually from an unusual early age. Um, and um, um, there was in the group uh, also the uh, um, uh, a reference being made to the idea of beauty and the media and how still it seems everywhere that just being young is uh, the ultimate idea of being beautiful and not really um, being a lot of attention to the to the beauty that is in in the maturation process and the beauty of age uh, and aging. Um, so, um, yes, and I don't know, I think uh, Elmar mentioned something with the uh, experience from hypnosis and there 
that that was also uh, mentioned from uh, uh, somebody in our group, a uh, kind of a, let's say a death experience within uh, hypnosis that actually felt as a great liberation and uh, uh, stripped away uh, the fears uh, of dying and um, was more reported as like a big weight and baggage dropping uh, off and a big liberation. So, um, yeah, so far from me. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. We have time still for one other share. Who wants to come in? I'm happy to like come to in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Who are you speaking to, to me? Yeah, yeah, I see your picture here. Michael. Oh, yeah. hi, Cindy. Yeah, Michael was there first. <laughs> well, Michael, you go. I would. I will. I'll go quick because it was just one yeah. sentence I wanted to say. <laughs> Thanks for interrupting, Elmer. Um, you, can, no, you can go mute now, so I, my picture shows up. Um, I'll just say one thing. We have an English expression uh, that many of you may not know, but you, if it's something you're really looking forward to, you say, "I'm dying to get there." I'm dying to do this. I'm dying to do that. So I just wanted to add that to the discussion. I'm dying to die. Mm, that's interesting. Thank you for that. One of the things that, that has made me very conscious of dying is being with a elderly parent who has a chronic disease who is dying over a period of time. Like my father had dementia and it took him five years before he died. And being with the dying who, ha who lose many of their faculties, uh, particularly their, their, their cognitive faculties, so our capacity to interact, to relate in our normalized way is severely challenged. And we, I, I learned to have a learn different language of communicating with my father um, that could connect with him without using using what 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 is a normal process for me is conversing. You know, I'm a, I'm a storyteller. I'm a coach. So learning the language of touch, of sound, of music, of movement, of facial expressions, uh, silence is a hugely meditative process and requires a complete new way of connecting. And also a realization that the dying, especially those that are not connecting in an obvious way with us, is not to make the assumption that they are not present and they're not aware. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, abuses is the assumption that those that are not interacting with us as we would normally interact are not present and we talk about them as if they are objects. Um, I, we try to stay with my, parent, my father as he died as if he was with us and listening to us and part of us all the way until he died. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very important perspective you now, how to be with the dying. And we will also cover that in some way uh, today. First, now I want to say, to tell you why it is the Conscious Aging and Ongoing Project. And for that, I want to do a little screen share. First of all, I want you to notice what I'm wearing. This I wore in the first integral conference. That's me and my husband, and we were trying to find people who wanted to be with us on podcasts. And as I said, uh, the next time in 2016, no, was it 2016? Yeah, we did the conscious aging uh, on the conference and Hans did the recording. And now I screen share just for a moment and I will show you how everything started. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so. This is for today. Uh, we started 2016, as you can say, and this is what you saw uh, at the beginning. 
the four ladies I have invited, all were guests in our shows before and some several times. And Monia on the left side, she isn't coming today. So on the left, you see me and my husband in very happy times here in our house. And we founded that together um, after the conference, Conscious Aging, because he was really very inspired. He, here you can see him in a screenshot uh, in the video which Hans took at the conference. Uh, you, if you want to copy this strange uh, URL, you can find the video there. And he was really totally inspired by understanding that he could live other 30 years because his mother died with 30, eh, 30, yeah, with 100. And so he, he thought he might have a lot of time left and he might do all sorts of things because he started living only when he was 60 and in retirement because he never liked, almost never liked what he did and what he, jobs he could do and providing for families and stuff like that. And then he was alone and he learned by his son-in-law to use computers and he came across Ken Wilber and Andrew Cohen and other people and he was so inspired. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point we met each other via Facebook, via an integral uh, conversation and we came together. He came over to me to Italy from Florida and we went to the conference and that was the first time he found a lot of people who were thinking like him, who were, you know, his tribe. He had never had that before. So we uh, founded the Conscious Aging, not only the Conscious Aging, we did conversations that matter, the Wisdom Factory podcast, video podcast already before. But after this conference, we started a Conscious Aging series and that was mainly his baby. He was so excited. And last conference for two years ago, we wanted to uh, talk about how it went with all these guests. And um, hmm, he was uh, diagnosed with cancer at Easter time. And here we have done a little video for the conference where he was talking about yeah, his stage and that he is Sorry not to be there. And they showed it on the conference. Yeah, and that's where he is now. And as you see, the spiral is with him. <laughs> now I'm very emotional again. <laughs> anyway, it's two years ago. Think about it. But I wanted to give him the possibility to spiral. He was so fascinated by the spiral. So I then continued. Also, I thought it was not really my topic. And I realized that it's getting my topic now too. And as I write here on the right side, um, we have more than 50 guests, 50 uh, videos on the conscious aging, and it's still going on. And as I said, I invite you to be my guest in the future. Here are some screenshots from the website where you find uh, conscious aging series uh, divided by seasons. And the very first one was Ashton Applewhite. She is an uh, activist for um, ageism, the discrimination by age. And this also opened my mind again, how much ageism is in ourselves without even noticing it. And this on the right side is the last uh, conscious agency series. You see here it's Anne and uh, Lorraine Laubscher. I invite you tomorrow night at uh, eight o'clock. I will have a conversation with her. She is uh, the collaborator of uh, Don Beck in the creation of the peaceful apartheid ending in South Africa and nobody knows her. And I got to know her, <coughs> excuse me, and I invited her for conscious aging, but also for other um, conversations. And tomorrow, the, she and John Freeman will talk about the, con the present situation seen from the spiral, from spiral dynamics, from the eyes of spiral dynamics. Yeah. And then I said, what, what is happening? I hear some information about the people which you see here, Anne Roberts, her 
maybe you can take a screenshot, but she will also probably give it to you later. And yeah, this would have been the poster to bring for the conference with all the, oh, I hope all the people who were showing up in our series. Then Mark did a Facebook group, uh, which is called Masterminding Integral Aging, and he was very active in there. I'm not as active, but if somebody is inspired to go there and, and be active, that would be good. Then I've created an Integral Aging website, and I thought Mark would uh, use it as his channel, but he was not a tech guy. The tech is my, my part, so I had... It is a little bit on hold. So if you want to see things, it's better on the wisdom factory dot net. Oh, I didn't try it here. That's not good. So next time I do it better. I hope so. So for me, that's all for the moment. And I give over to Jane. Uh, we can't hear you yet, Jane. There. Yes, it's okay now. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> right. Hello, everyone. And um, I um, probably just need to say where I'm from, which is uh, in the north of Scotland, up near the Fintorn Foundation. That's what I should have said earlier. Some of you may know the Fintorn Foundation, the spiritual community that's been going for a long time. I'm uh, associated with that. And um, I just want to acknowledge Heidi and your vulnerability there. That's what happens with grief. It comes and visits in its own time and it just is there. And you were a lovely example of just being with it, which is one of the things that people don't like to do in our society. And um, that and along with talking about death which is one of the things that came up in the breakout room people we don't want to talk about it in our western society for most part for the most part it's uncomfortable so here we're all at least relatively comfortable with it because otherwise we wouldn't be here um, or at least comfortable with aging we're comfortable enough to be on the call so anyway i just wanted to acknowledge that because so often we just don't do that Right, so back to my story. My uh, husband also died, so, um, but I had the pleasure of knowing Mark before, um, um, before he died as well. And, but now Heidi and I have something in common that we probably wish that we didn't have in common, but anyway, we do. And uh, as I was saying earlier, the results of the book that I wrote about that were people wanting telling me that they wanted to talk about very practical things to do with dying. Now, what I've discovered, because that has led on to running courses, running groups, all online, um, to do with having people complete their end of life plans. And what I've discovered is that by focusing on the practical, it's almost as if that is an indirect way of coming to this subject because whether we like it or not whether we believe in the afterlife or not whether we think that our body is all that we have or we think that we are more than our body there is a body left over when the life has gone out of it and it does have to be dealt with by somebody and not only a body but all the um all the associations of the life that was being lived and so that's a lot of the work that I do, which is inviting people to face death because actually it brings you to life. It really does. And who was it? I think it was Cherie was mentioning that actually you can have fun even talking about this topic. I mean, somebody once said fun. They described a funeral as a fun oral, but actually the word that most people use to describe the courses that I do once they're participating is that they are enjoyable. So actually it is true, we can enjoy this topic and hopefully we're doing that today. So um, conscious aging, 
I don't think we can age consciously without being willing to face death. I don't think we can do it without facing the end. It's a li- I was thinking about it this morning and it's a little bit like um, having the importance of having boundaries. You know, with uh, two-year-olds, how it's very important to hold firm boundaries so that they begin to feel safe and everything. Well, if you like, death is a boundary. And if we're willing to acknowledge that boundary, then actually we can come more fully into our present life. And that's, I think, what I mean by enjoyable. And one of the things that happened for me after my husband died was that I became um, horrified that I, I knew obviously that I could die, but I became horrified that I would die and I wasn't enjoying myself. So I began to filter everything through the sentence, am I enjoying myself? Really, really simple. And if I wasn't, I stopped doing it. And I still do that to a large extent today. And obviously there are some things that we have to do. Taxes comes to mind. That's not one of the things that I would normally say that I enjoy, <laughs> but it just has to be done. Um, but, but basically, if we're not enjoying ourselves, what is the point? So. That happened for me in relationship to coronavirus. And maybe it's happened for you as well, because lots of people, well, I imagine that lots of people get the opportunity with this lockdown to contemplate this, although I'm not exactly sure that that is happening. But for me, it occurred to me that I really, I could die. I could die this summer. I could get the virus and it might end up in me dying. It's unlikely, but it was a possibility. And what became very clear was that I needed to make some changes in my life. And that meant spending more time down at the house that my new partner is building for us together. And even though if I died this summer, I wouldn't get into that house to live with him because it's not going to be ready until at least the end of the year. At least I would have been involved in the creation of it. And that felt really, really important. So I had to make some uh, changes to my uh, daily rhythm, if you like. Um, so what other things did I want to yes I wanted to talk about an end of life plan most people haven't heard of the expression end of life plan most people when they think about death they think about um, the will getting the will done and they think about maybe they think about whether they want to be buried or cremated and that's it and if you've thought about those things and you've taken care of everything but actually that's there's a lot more to it than that and if you've been with around somebody who has died whether or not just taking care of everything afterwards or in the run-up to it as well you'll realize that there's an awful lot more and so an end of life plan consists of the legal stuff of course but it also consists of the end of life care and I can't remember who it was who was talking earlier about being with somebody as they're going through the process of dying like over five years with um, dementia or whatever but there is lots that has to be taken care of as people who uh, their body begins to just get older and older and older and then there's more to be done after that body has uh, taken its last breath so The things that are covered in an end of life plan are the legals, the end of life care, the advanced statement. This is all stuff that you can do beforehand. The advanced, I should say advanced decision. It's called different things in different countries. It's it's what's known as a living will. The statement that you make of the treatment that you don't want before you die. That's really important. If you haven't come across it, please, please look it up because we, you will get treated no matter what, because that's the default position in our societies. So if you don't want to be treated, if you get certain conditions, you need to look up what happens in your country about that and do it. Um, And obviously we go into much more of that in the work that I do. Um, There is also the, if you want to I do what I call have what I call a do-it-yourself death now it's not of course you because you're the one who's died but the people afterwards sometimes people want to really not involve a funeral director or only involve them minimally 
But if that's the sort of thing that you want to do, you have to think about it beforehand, because otherwise, by default, this is what will happen. The funeral director will take care of it all. And that if you don't educate yourself beforehand, then you don't have an option about that, because in the midst of the grief, you do what you think needs to happen. And that's whatever it is that you've grown up with. Um, okay, the other things are, um, how does your household work? If you're somebody who's left behind and you're not sure about the household work works, like, for example, I'm sure there's some people here who um, don't know how to uh, operate the computer system or the router or the central heating system or any of the other things that make our households work. This is one of the things that I found out to um, my detriment after Philip had gone. He, he, he wasn't there. He couldn't sort those things out. And actually, when you're grieving, you really don't need that kind of stuff. And it can be dealt with beforehand if it has been put down in writing or it at least talked about. And somebody mentioned talking about earlier, talking about this and how important it is to have conversations about this with your parents, with your children, with your friends, with your colleagues. But how do you do that? And that's really can be quite a challenge. And of course, we go into that more in the work that I do. But the main thing is that you have to have a context. Now, actually, we do have a context now because of coronavirus, but I don't know how many people are still actually having these conversations or daring to have them. It takes one brave person usually to start it. And what I found is that once somebody starts it, there's many other people who are relieved that the elephant in the room has been addressed. And so I, if, you, if you're one of those people who's been a bit nervous, then I really encourage you to just say, for example, I've been on this um, seminar about conscious aging and there was a presenter talking about dying. What do you think about it? Because there's the context. It's been part of your life, so you're thinking about it. And that's the sort of thing that we do with people when we're, we're, we're having conversation with them. We share with, with them what's going on in our lives. Um, so other aspects that need to be taken care of are your digital life, because your digital life lives on unless you've taken care of it beforehand. And not that that's a bad thing or a good thing, but you might want to make a conscious decision about it beforehand. So I think um, it's really important that we take the time now before it's really needed, before we're even near to death, although of course we don't know when it's going to happen, to just consider the fact that we have a body. It is going to have no breath in it at some point, and somebody else is going to have to take care of the aftermath. One of the other things that people are uh, concern, often concerned about but don't actually do anything about is the amount of stuff that you have in your house. So if you just look around your room right now and you see all this stuff lying around and it's all stuff maybe that you use, but somebody's going to have to take care of that after you've gone. And if you want any of that to be, um, to go to somebody or to be honoured in some way or that you, there is a story attached to any of that, then that needs to be communicated and passed on. And that's a large part of the work that we do at Before I Go Solutions. I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, yeah, I'm aware that the time is probably up. Nobody's told me what the time is and I forgot to have a look and to see when I started. <laughs> but maybe we can come back a bit later to talk about this. Um, because what I'm doing is really practical. And by focusing on the practical, we're enabled for the emotional stuff to be taken care of at another time perhaps because I thought that people would it would be a very emotional topic but it's more of an emotional topic in the fear of talking about it than it is when you actually do it yeah. thank, so, you. thank you thank you okay we might have at the end a little some some minutes to answer questions and so you can probably answer some of yes them. of course uh, I would go over to Bettina Bettina are you there yeah, thank you. 
Yes, I will. Um, I will do a workshop about conscious aging after this um, panel. So I decided, and Heidi asked me for um, talking about um, the other topic I work about, and that is dementia from an integral perspective. And I will share some slides of a, a presentation I. Um, I, I did um, at the IEC 2018. Um, I, I work as a gerontologist and uh, I've specialized myself on, um, on teaching nurses in how to communicate with people with dementia. And I also work with people with dementia and with relatives. And um, the integral... Um, the, the, the integral framework is for me uh, a wonderful instrument to, to, to show the complexity and to, be, to learn to be aware of this complexity, not just showing, not just writing down, but learning to be aware of this, this complexity of dementia in every moment when we work with people with dementia. And um, it is one of the most important topic in the field of aging at the moment. I don't know if it will will um, keep on because we have um, the bad numbers for the future, but I don't believe in them because I think if we become more and more aware of what dementia means and what are um, risks for dementia, we can do a lot. Um, I just, because it's not so much time now, um, I just want to give a short um, insight in that what I'm, what I'm doing um, and what I, about what I did research. I wrote my master's thesis in gerontology about an integral concept on dementia, and this is a little bit out of that. Um, if you um, mostly when you talk with people on uh, about dementia, they focus on one or two aspects of this complexity. Mostly they ask, "Oh, what's with Alzheimer's?" and "Or oh, what's what, what what's with um, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia?" and um, or oh, my father has also, and it's regular, it's normal that we all focus from our, on our own perspective on this, what we call a disease. For me, it's not a disease. Um, it's an entity. I look on dementia as an entity. It's something that is. And it's not just in the person who got the diagnose. But we mostly focus on the upper right quadrant. Um, some aspects of that uh, is, uh, are um, atrophy of the brain, molecular aspects, biomarkers. We look on behavior, uh, especially when it comes to frontotemporal dementia, what is um, really a challenge for both, for uh, the person who has this um, uh, behavior and for the relatives. Um, we have uh, aspects of mobility, of sleep disturbances, of sexuality. It's a, it's a, a huge topic when we talk about dementia. We talk about communicative abilities and behaviors and tests and screening. But this is right, just the uh, upper right quadrant. And um, we have to take it all. And I just briefly go through that and then want to show some other aspects. Um, the, the, the lower right quadrant, when we talk about dementia, we don't often um, think about is the architecture of nursing homes. It's a, re it's a really important topic. How, um, how, um, how is the environment of a person of dementia that uh, uh, dementia doesn't grow because um, the environment dementors, de uh, increases the dementia? Um, the question of the legal competence of a person with dementia. It's critical. Health insurance, then we have in Germany, we have expert standards. We have the whole um, uh, disease catalogs of the ICD. We have questions of epidemiolo <laughs> epidemiology. And um, when we, um, that's the right, uh, the, these are the right quadrants as we know them from the equal um, model, um, most people focus on that, but we have to focus on the, on the um, left quadrants too. And the, I, what I really think is important is, is the lower left quadrant, 
the cultural aspects, what, what does dementia mean? Um, dementia um, is a stigma in our culture, but if you learn, uh, but if you talk to people um, with, an, um, with dementia in early stages, uh, you don't understand what, uh, or you don't uh, get the diagnose and um, the behavior and uh, you see together. So we have to, to question our own, um, our, our own meaning about dementia. We have uh, the, pro the challenge in relationships, in marriage and grandparenthood. It's a real challenge. No one talks about so much. Um, we have dementia. That's why I talk about dementia as an entity. Dementia shows up in, in fiction literature, in mu movies. It's not just in the person I, I'm, I'm seeing who's diagnosed. It, it, it's all, about, all around us. We have dementia activists, persons with people with dementia who go outside, who, who, who um, talk um, on conferences. We have yes, civic engagement. And last but not least, of course, the upper left quadrant. And there we have to, to, to hold the perception of dementia of all involved persons. We mostly um, look just on one or two involved persons, the relative and the and, and the person with dementia, but forget the, the neighborhood and so on. They all have an influence of that what is constructed there. And then some other aspect, what I think we don't talk enough about is psychotrauma. In, um, it, it's um, suspected as one of the main causes for dementia. So I think we will have to do more work at this po that point in future. And then I did more research and I will just give a short insight in that because I took, I, I hope you're all familiar with the, with the quadrant uh, model and uh, the integral map and zone one is, a, uh, is the inner in aspect of the um, upper left quadrant. Um, it shows here the insights of a person from dementia, the inside, how um, a person with dementia um, experience what is, uh, what is happening. And I use this, uh, I worked it out with uh, spiral dynamics. I use this model when I have to diagnose people um, in a nursing home, which kind of environment in this nursing home is, is the right one for them. And you can see that uh, persons with people with dementia, um, uh, yes, when, when the dementia goes on, they, they go in some kind of regression. You can explain with the spiral dynamics. We have people on uh, a blue, uh, on the blue level of um, spiral dynamics. And um, they show up something like um, they, they, they behave in some case like something changed. I know, um, I feel ashamed. We have a lot of shame with people uh, with dementia when they are on, on, on something like a blue um, level. And um, they often ask, sometimes the whole day they ask, um, oh, sorry, Oop, something went wrong. So here, um, they often, uh, ask uh, themselves, what will they think about me? And no, 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 I can't meet them any longer. We have um, often the development when when a person with dementia goes into regression, that it comes to and it comes to this um, phase that they um, avoid to go into uh, the dining hall together with other people and so on. And then the regression goes on and um, people become more and more uh, furious about all the people around because they have to um, uh, they they um, they're fighting ag against the others because they can't see the changes inside of them they always uh, project the changes on the others and so we have um, a lot of um, angel in them that's the red um, level and then, and you can really see that, 
they go on, the regression goes on, and they go back to the purple level. And then you can see the people who two months ago, they were fighting against um, the nurses, and now everything changed. They want to sit at the table next to them and want to be in the community. And we can see this regression on and on. You can see the beige level at the end. Uh, even this level at the end. So I think my time is um, over. I want just to give one one um, one uh, view in the future. I'm doing um, research together with Terry O'Fallon about that at the moment. We are um, trying to uh, research, do research about the per perspectives people t uh, take on dementia. We had a little sample with 10, 20 people who took an in inventory with dementia stems and yes hope next year on the conference we can present about that what we have uh, found there okay thank you yeah, thank you very much bettina we also had a, a conversation at the wisdom factory in english and one in german so if you are interested to hear a whole hour about this and go deeper with the slides you can come over to thewisdomfactory.net and then you'll find Bettina Wichers and you will find uh, her contributions. So let's go over to Anne. Hello. So uh, hello from Scotland. So I have a story to tell. Um, I was a working mum and I ran my own business and uh, towards the end of my career I was employed at the Scottish Police College to teach leadership to senior police officers. It was an absolutely wonderful end to my working career um, to be with these very able dedicated people and then I retired and I can remember feeling unsettled and I leapt and went back to university and I did a master's in applied social research. I'd had a bit of a mixed academic career as a youngster. I didn't do very well at university and I think um, it was a niche I needed to scratch. So I went back to uni, to Stirling University, and it was wonderful to be with these young people who took me under their wing. I was really stretched technically and how that whole world worked. And interestingly, I wanted to use integral theory as part of my dissertation, but there was quite a bit of resistance um, from the staff around it hasn't been peer reviewed. And it was so interesting because many of the people that they were proposing we studied probably were not peer reviewed at their time. So I had a bit of a dance with that. So I did uh, my master's and at the same time as that, I was what was called, I research it now, um, part of the club sandwich generation. Now the sandwich generation are women and men who have aging parents and children. Where I was, I had aging parents, adult children and grandchildren. And I had four frail uh, parents into their 90s. And I went from an uh, empty nester to uh, caring for my husband and I's parents, four daughters between us, our second marriage, who were looking for support with grandchildren. And we were also going through dementia um, and clearing a family, two family homes actually, um, which I found very stressful. So what Jane speaks about touches me very deeply, I can remember. And I came across the work of a woman called Mary Catherine Bateson at that time. Um, and she was the daughter of Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson. And she studied with a gentleman called Eric Erickson who in the 50s crafted a life cycle model called the eight stages of man. And what Mary Catherine Bateson was doing was researching um, what was happening with healthy longevity. And what she identified was a new stage was emerging, which she called adulthood two. And it was between the stage of generativity, which is work and parenting and what have you, and 
old age. And another stage, actually, I, I came forward um, called very old age, but that's a, another story for another day. Um, and what Mary Catherine Bateson said in her adulthood to description really spoke to me. It helped me understand the discomfort I was experiencing. And what she was arguing was we were going through a similar identity crisis to what Erickson described uh, that young people go through from adolescence to young adulthood. And she, it, she described that and it was like, my goodness, I, I get this. This really helps me to sense into what is going on for me. Um, and the adventure that adulthood too is, but also the challenge that it is. And in Erickson's model, there is a virtue identified at each stage and a vulnerability. And what Mary Catherine Bateson said, the virtue of this adulthood two stage, she called act of wisdom. And it's about finding your way to giving back from a life well lived and to be out in the world, you know, kind of like me going back to university or additional travel or new activities and finding the time to do things that you perhaps didn't do and were called to do. The vulnerability she described as withdrawal and I got that. I could sense into not wanting to step fully out into life and not trusting my skills and my insights and my knowing the way I used to. But I also realized in the stages state, um, I, I was regress, I wanted to regress back to orange, where I'd been very successful, you know, and I was an achiever and I was competitive and I'm really good at what I did. I was a good project manager, da 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 da. da. Um, but actually, I was being called to move through the spiral more as I became a grandparent, as I was relaxing into um, the the time I had to explore and that's something I'm really interested in now is working with this uh, adulthood two generation to say with more time with more space um, how do we move up the spiral and, and that intrigues me and I'm just going to share my screen if that's okay very quickly to show you my blog um, because um, recently I interviewed uh, John Freeman, who has been mentioned a couple of times, about um, an introduction to spiral dynamics. But then we moved on to hear elderhood and spiral dynamics. And so if you'd like to hear a look at spiral dynamic, a look at elderhood through the lens of spiral dynamics, um, that's there. So there's lots more I could say, but I think probably, Heidi, that's sufficient. Please nod. Yes, um, and I'll pop the blog address in there. One of the things I'm really passionate about is supporting others through this stage and finding their way to their unique purpose, to quest for that and to do that in relationship intergenerationally. I'm really interested in, as you can see there, the dance of elders and youngers. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Anne. Put the glasses so, back. Now you have an impression of what we would do in a longer session and Anne could go further and Jane could go further. Bettina will have the occasion right after this session to go further with a different topic, no? Integral life practice, uh, conscious aging. Uh, so I would now, we have about 15 minutes uh, left I would ask you to ask your questions to come in and, and ask whoever you want, whatever you want, and let's have a group conversation. I don't have a question necessarily, but I was just thinking, and I wonder if you have all felt this, this whole Corona situation has brought me closer to this, uh, yeah, looking at death in a way that I've never looked at it before. Of course, it's a it's a threat that we've never experienced as a society or even globally. And that has brought such a change for me in the way I look at it and the way I think about it. And I think uh, in terms of our relationship as well, this uh, 
withdrawal from society for a while, just staying in place at home and the time we've spent with each other has really helped us to live more in the now, I think, and uh, to allow flow, uh, just to live in the flow. All, those, all these kinds of things have become much more important and it's been a, a, a very positive experience, even though it's looking at death. Can I just say something about that? Because that's my experience of looking at death is actually a positive experience. So it's really lovely to hear you say that, Cindy. And I hope that is the case for many people. I'm not sure it, it is, but hopefully, yeah. Thank you. I just posted into the chat um, all the addresses where people, these people you saw here uh, speak. Uh, where they came in the Wisdom Factory. And I don't know if you are aware that you can download the chat, so you will have the addresses all there. And there was also the request to Anne to put your blog address into that. So afterwards you could click on the right side of the chat box. There are three little dots and there it gives you the possibility to download the chat. So you will have all the links. And when you have some time, you can go and find out what these people are doing. Okay, over to the audience again. Can I speak, Heidi? I, I think this about the coronavirus um, is so interesting for us at the moment. One of the things I'm very interested in, in my well-being, which is an aspect of active wisdom for me, that we, we take care of ourselves, is to watch out for fear and anxiety. And I'm looking into, with a, a group, um, what is immune resilience? Um, and the, the balance of immune resilience around my spiritual resilience, my emotional resilience, my physical resilience, and my intellectual resilience, and calling that forward so that in integral speak, we can work with what's true and partial that we are bombarded with. And for me, it's finding where are the sources of information that I trust around this. And one of the people that I've been following, if anyone's interested, is Dr. Zach Bush, who's a, an American doctor who is giving a very balanced insight into what is actually happening uh, with this. And that has helped me to stay not fearful. And I've loved what people have said about being comfortable with dying. I think that's a piece that he's brought forward as well. And he spoke about death being similar to birth. And, you know, we go through a similar birthing channel. And that really helped me to settle. Uh, I'm Victor from Singapore. Can I say something? Sure, go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, this whole thing about coronavirus is, it's about, you know, being able to be nearer to God, nearer to our, to our higher power, because uh, it, we have to stay at home and think about these things. And then we, and a lot of people who, uh, who, who were atheists before now begin to pray again. So we get nearer to our spirit and to our spiritual uh, being. Uh, I think it's important that you know, in the Nag Hammarubi uh, findings, uh, the Gospel of Thomas says that uh, when Jesus was asked, you know, uh, what, is the, what is it like to be in the end? He says, if you want to know the end, just go to the beginning. And I found that really useful in my whole life. And that, that the end will be the beginning when we go again to who we are really us. We were never born and never die. So it's only our body is going to die. And something we can be very happy because we get relieved and we get liberated when we become the spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other question to our presenters or to me? Oh. 
of comment or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> a comment, Gertraud. Um, actually, I'm, I'm very grateful for this session for all of you because you brought each and every one an, another aspect to it. And I was invited several times by you, <laughs> Heidi. I never made it. And, and today it was really like, um, I just turned 64. So maybe it's time to, to be more conscious about it. Yeah. And, and so thank you very much for, for all your aspects, the practical, the spiral dynamics, the, the dementia part. And I think for, for me sitting with my parents when they, they died, the last days, it really took my fear of death away. It was with my, my father to really was about forgiveness and him calming down by doing this from to that I could really give him something to calm down and his fear of death went away. And uh, for my mother, who really like a little girl, she was she had dementia, and like a little girl, she was just going to the light, <laughs> and and um, yeah, I sat there I, the whole night, and and it was just peaceful and. Yeah, so there's nothing horrible about it. Maybe the pain and, and all what, yeah. But um, to go that consciously, it's really, really important. And, and we sat at my mother's, uh, we were, um, my, my siblings and not everybody could be there the whole time. And so we were drinking beer and eating ice cream and laughing, but always somebody had to hold her hand. So she never let go before the next one was taking over. And, and it was a wonderful time those four days. And yeah, with everybody. So yeah, thank you very much, everybody again. Thank you, Gert. And I still miss Mark when you talk about him. Is yeah, we really I spent. A I, I totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. Could you, Could you mute yourself, Gert? Yeah. Uh, I totally agree because being with the people who die, it is difficult, but it's giving you a sense of sac sacred moment. And to you really be with them, and you also have a good goodbye by being there in the moment. Because if you hear that your mother has died and you are far away, that's different. You are still not having the completion. And I had several people accompanied to dying my mother, my father, and now Mark, um, and a previous partner too. So it is difficult, but I recommend it to everybody to, if you have the chance, take holiday, go away from work and do that work of the heart for the people you love. It's not only for them, it's also very much for them, but it's also for you. So that's my take on that. And again, who hasn't seen it? That's me and Mark. <laughs> Okay, who else? We have still one or two comments or questions. Heidi Anatoly has raised his hand in the chat. And uh, Michael Scott, I can see his <laughs> hand being raised. Um, I'm happy to go. Sorry, I'm jumping in a bit. Um, it sounds like there's two conversations that are going on. Um, the one is our own dying and learning to be learning to die by being with the dying and i think we can never we can never practice our own dying 
So we can never rehearse it, but we can gain in a huge amount from being very conscious and very intentional with those that are dying, and particularly those that are dying from chronic conditions, not those that have a heart attack in the middle of the night, because then that's a very different uh, circumstance. My mother died overnight with a heart attack, and there was no dying process. My father took five years to die, and that was the greatest learning experience I think I could have. I think also one of the other points is our notion of what happens after death. Um, that affects how we, we, how I think about death. And I haven't reconciled myself to whether the spirit lives on or whether, as Owen Yalom says, you know, as an existentialist, when we die, we die, nothing else exists. And how much of a death anxiety does that bring up? And I try to work on the basis that, well, maybe there is something after death, but I won't guarantee that. So I want to live fully now and learn as much as I can. Um, and Anne, I loved what you said about sort of the second elderhood phase. It's how do I live now fully into my life as an older person with the experience of being with people that have died and very closely uh, and using that as a source of inspiration to to share the gifts that I have uh, I have developed uh, and been privileged to have with uh, with my fellow human beings. Yeah, thank you. And last, Anatoly, glad to see you here. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, it's fine. <clears throat> my mama passed uh, uh, this last November and uh, uh, we w w uh, we wasn't very close for my whole life but we become much much like really close and I last her year we, we talk a lot and um, she constantly uh, told me that I am so tired here. I I want to go. I want uh, you be much. It will be much more easier for you if I go. I, I said no, mom. Please, just hang on. Everything is all right. Your health is okay. You, you don't have to think and to talk like that. And but she keep saying that I want to go. Everything will be better for you. And um, uh, but every day when I when we talk, she constantly keeps saying, keep talking with me about people she hate. Uh, she got a lot of pain through her life. She is a child of war, and uh, she was and uh, uh, she's got a lot of pain from her relatives, from her colleagues, and she keep talking about, whoa, she said to me like this and this, how could her tell me this? It's, it's not about me, I was a kind person, I didn't, uh, I, 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 ha I hadn't done anything like that. And I, I asked my mother, mom, please forgive them, please forgive them. Like, it's it's uh, they, they most of them uh, she was 85 when she passed away most of your like enemies is gone now they are not with you please forgive them it's not your business to judge them let god judge them why do you take his tasks let he accomplish his tasks just please forgive them Forgive me, I, I said to her, I, I have done something I'm not proud of. Please forgive me. Please don't judge me. And uh, I cannot, she said, I cannot. It's so hard. Uh, I, I hate them. And it was look like that she was like hanging. He, she was like holding for life by hatred, by, by hating someone. Like, I hate them, and this is why I'm still alive. And, th and then uh, it's, it was like, 
I, I was keep telling her, forgive them. And once she said, I forgive you for me. And then she said, I forgive. She forgave her, her mother and her father, her relatives, her colleagues. And she was so quiet last days and she passed away in a sleep. And I, uh, uh, in, that, in that days, I remembered when my dad passed away five years ago, I, he, she, she, he has also, he, she had also a lot of hatred about people who hurt him. And I explained him that, like I, I kind of explained what, what would I know about it. I explained like, if you, if you go, if you die with hate, you are very heavy. You, you, your earth will take you closer to, and you cannot fly to God. Please, and they are not quite educated, my parents, and I must have, uh, I must uh, you, uh, explain them like in, a, in this kind of metaphors, and, but it's like a heavy weight. Your hate is a heavy weight, take, like keeping you here, and taking you away from God. Just forgive everybody. And I, uh, my mother died near me. Uh, and uh, I, I think I explained her that forgiveness is like a way to healthy, I don't know how to say that, a way to like die with goodwill I, I don't know how to say it. I, I, I don't have enough words to explain this yeah thank you that's very touching I felt it in my heart you know I think we have learned a lot in this session and I hope it has the same effect on you and you will follow the advices of Jane <laughs> and learn from each other's stories. Yeah, thank you for having been here. And also Jane and, and uh, where, where is she? Disappeared, Bettina. And you can see her, as I said, afterwards. And very much thank you, Carmen, for your help. And everyone who has shared, everyone who has just listened. We have a little poll about the session. Could you bring it up, Carmen? And please take about, it takes a, a minute. Um, I think you are already used to it. So just go through it and fill it in. And then, yeah, thank you. And I'm very touched and hope to see you again. We can uh, un unmute everybody and maybe make a silent commitment to ourselves for our own death and for the death we are will be witnessing and maybe we can say I commit or something like that. I commit to learn about my own death. Please feel free. I commit. I commit. I commit to learn about my own death. I commit. I commit. Thank you. Thank you very much. And hope to see you again in this conference and later on. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.